Matt Fitzgerald and I would like to show you how Bayesian modeling can help understand your patients and the condition of their auditory system. We want to better understand the population dynamics and, more importantly, we want to use the ensemble of data to better understand each individual patient. Let me tell you what we've been working on. Here is our goal. We want to use Bayesian modeling to enhance our data. This will allow us to use the prior expectations that we have about our measurements and model parameters to better understand patients for whom we are missing data. The experiments we will describe are based on 90,000 patients, 50,000 for which we have super threshold speech recognition and noise test results. There are many reasons to do this, but a very simple example occurs when we are missing a threshold measurement. Do we simply ignore it? Or can we be smarter about what values make sense? We are interested in creating highly detailed models of individual hearing loss, taking into account both peripheral and central issues. There are many tests we can use to describe the patient's state, but probably more tests than we'll be able to get from, very, from every, every patient. We might have 12 tests from a large number of patient patients. How do you use the entire ensemble of tests to fill in the missing data for a new patient? Eventually, we want to reason about which tests we should perform next to get the best diagnostic benefit. In summary, we want to use Bayesian modeling to help us reason from incomplete data. This is our model of hearing. Sound arrives at the ear and contains 100% of the information that is available to a listener. There is processing on the periphery, such as done by the cochlea, and is measured by a threshold test. Changes to the periphery can only degrade the information. Then, the central processing system takes over and it too has limits. Most importantly, it can only degrade the speech information. Thus, for our modeling efforts, the information available to the auditory system can only go down as is processed by each stage. The audiometric tests give us information largely about the periphery, then central processing mechanisms do the best they can. Eventually, we hope, resulting in a successful speech recognition, even in noise. Thus, a second principle of our models is that the variance or degradations are not symmetric. Normally, we have perfect hearing, but various degradations change our ability always for the worst. Thus, a symmetric factor model, such as principal components, which is based on a Gaussian model, doesn't make sense. An asymmetric distribution, such as the skewed Gaussian or an exponential distribution, will be a better fit for our cognitive models. Here is an outline of this presentation. We will first motivate and introduce Bayesian modeling. Second, we will apply these ideas to a simple model of speech and noise recognition via the Quicksand test. Finally, we will describe a first attempt to model peripheral and central degradations. We want to know the probability that a certain set of model parameters explains the input data, the features, and the resulting output. Bayesian modeling tries to find a posterior distribution which is the probability of the parameters theta, given the input and output data. The input might be hearing thresholds and other measurements, and the output might be a speech and noise measure. It is important to note that the resulting model parameters are themselves random variables, since we do not have exact data or models. So how do we calculate this posterior? Bayes' rule is the key. We start with a theoretical model that predicts the output, i.e the speech recognition score from the input data, i.e. the hearing thresholds. This model connects these two ideas together, but often comes with a large number of parameters. The denominator of this equation, the probability of the output, doesn't affect the best parameters, so we can drop it, leaving two terms, the likelihood and the prior. The prior encodes what we know about the parameters ahead of time, such as that it is positive or Gaussian, or perhaps even uniform within a range. That just leaves a likelihood. How can we evaluate it? Here's a simple example of the likelihood. The X's in these plots represent some data for which we'd like to find a model. We can evaluate the likelihood of a model, in this case, a simple one-dimensional Gaussian, and show how adjusting the parameters maximizes the likelihood. Of course, for a Gaussian model, we can explicitly calculate the best parameters, but the principles we illustrate here are the same for more complicated models, which are, for which there are no closed form solution. 
At the top of each plot, we show the likelihood of the probability of the model for the current set of parameters. In the top row, we adjust the model's mean and see the negative log likelihood decline from 212 to 124. This is good. Likewise, in the bottom row, when we adjust the variance of the model, we see the likelihood of the model decrease from 124 to 35, negative log likelihood decreasing 124 to 35. The likelihood of this two parameter space are indicated in these two graphs, showing a sharp peak near the correct mean on the left and a very broad peak on the right for the best variance. In brief, we want to find the model parameters theta that maximize the likelihood. In principle, this is simple, but in practice, the models are high dimensional, highly nonlinear, and not convex. We want to find the complete distribution, not just the peak. We don't even know where to start. The solution is to randomly sample the parameter space and evaluate the model's likelihood. This is easy for simple parameters that follow easy to model distributions, like uniform or Gaussian. But what do we do for complicated likelihood distributions? We can use various forms of MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo to explore the distribution. In the simple example shown here, we don't know the larger, we don't know the target distribution, but we do know a distribution is always greater than the one we want. Then, thus, we can use rejection sampling. We sample from the proposed distribution, and then based on the ratio of the two distributions at each point, we accept a fraction of the proposed points, as we have done for the point in green, or reject it as we do for the two red points. By this means, we can generate points that follow the unknown distribution. Let's put these ideas to use on audiological data. Our tests in this talk are all based on modeling a patient's performance on a supra-threshold speech recognition test known as QuickSyn. This is a high-level measure of auditory functionality, testing the subject's ability to understand speech in a noisy environment. We would like to connect the patient's thresholds to speech and noise performance and characterize the unknown aspects. Each QuickSyn test is a list of sentences with a gradually decreasing signal to noise ratio. Here's one example with moderate noise. I hope you heard some of those words. The subject's recognition results are translated into a signal noise ratio for which they get 50% of the words right. Normal listeners can understand the speech all the way down to 0 dB, while impaired listeners need a higher signal noise ratio to hear 50% of the words. Let's compare quick sync performance versus hearing thresholds. Most hearing assistance is based on hearing thresholds, here represented in terms of the high frequency pure tone average. But what is disconcerting is that even for the same high frequency frequency pure tone average threshold, there is a wide range of quicksand scores. Thus, patients with a pure tone average of 60 dB at the center of this graph can have anywhere from near perfect speech recognition to abysmal results. Where are these results coming from? We first demonstrate fitting a Bayesian model to predict quicksand scores from hearing thresholds and the patient's age. We start with a linear model based on eight pure tone thresholds and the subject's age for a total of nine input features, that is X. The beta term, a matrix, linear connects the features to the output. Depending on whether we're using a diagonal or full covariance model, this gives us either 10 or 82 parameters. Our first goal is to predict the quicksand score and the uncertainty given these nine features. Here is a graphical description of our model. We are modeling the data with a Gaussian distribution as shown in the gray circle. The mean of this distribution is determined by the input features, threshold and age, and the variance of the distribution is a learned parameter. We wish to find a linear model that translates input features into Gaussian parameters that maximize the likelihood of the data. Note, we're not simply doing linear regression as we don't want the best answer under the mean squared error inherent in linear regression, but want to understand the distribution of model parameters that best explain the data. 
The peak of this distribution is the maximum a posterior distribution and is akin to the linear regression result. But the Bayes model also tells us the uncertainty in this decision. This is important so we can judge the accuracy and applicability of the model. Here are the multiplicative factors that we learned to best predict the quicksand scores. There are many ways to get a good prediction, but in this model, we see that the 2000 Hertz threshold is most important, perhaps because it says something about the position of the F2 and F3 formants. The bars show the high density interval, which are the most likely values for each parameter. We can now use this model to extrapolate to patients we haven't seen. Recall that the quicksand score is a signal noise ratio when the subject can understand 50% of the words correctly. A healthy or normal auditory system has a lower quicksand SNR score. All the results are based on the same learned model. The first graph shows the quicksand distribution for patients with flat hearing loss between 0 and 90 dB. Unsurprisingly, the quicksand distribution shifts from the far left for those patients that are normal and have 0 dB of threshold loss to the far right for those patients that have a, a flat 90 dB loss, loss at all frequencies. This is not too surprising. The second graph is more interesting. Here we keep the threshold flat, in this case 30 dB, and show the model's predictions as a function of the patient's age. We see a slow but steady, robust growth in the quicksand score, including ages for which we don't have enough data to predict on our own. Finally, the last graph shows the predictions as a function of gender. Here we see a consistent difference with female pa patients on the top show higher and thus worse speech and noise performance across all ages. Now we want to build a more detailed model. We anticipate that some losses are due to peripheral issues, such as measured by a hearing threshold, and others are due to central or cortical issues. How can we disentangle these differences? We want to further develop our model to account for peripheral or central losses. We hypothesize that the hearing thresholds put an upper limit on the subject's performance. We want to model this upper limit, call it a baseline, and attribute any further degradation as a central loss. We model this central loss with a multiplicative asymmetric distribution, where normal listeners have a central score of one and less fortunate subjects decline towards zero. As we incorporate more tests, we will refine this model, but this two-part model gives us an indication of where we want to go. Our model is predicated on the idea that the auditory system is subject to various kinds of degradations, all of which can only hurt our performance on a test like quicksand. We have plotted performance of our patients as a function of the Speech Intelligible Building Index, or SII, because, because it includes information about the relative thresholds that are perhaps better connected to speech recognition than a pure tone average. We hypothesize a line like the red dashed line indicates the bottom line of performance as a function of threshold. Hearing thresholds increase, get worse, as the SI, SII on the horizontal axis gets smaller and speech and noise performance is worse with increasing SNR loss. We want to model the baseline and the excess loss, which, are, which we are hypothesizing is due to central issues. We've replotted our data in terms of our speech ability, reversing the axis so we can talk about the peripheral performance and then additional degradations due to other losses start at one and decline. This is the data we want to fit. Again, we have our baseline determined by the subject's threshold and is represented by SII. We are modeling degradations using what is known as a skewed normal distribution. We tried a half normal distribution, but the hard cutoff was problematic for the noisy data. We want to fit the width, fit the width of the distribution, which cuts off, cuts off at one, to the degradation that we see with our quicksand data. These are the kind of results we see. The bottom bar at the top shows the predictive peripheral baseline is actually thick indicating that we don't know the exact value. The lower line shows the estimated variance of the skewed normal distribution. Here, trying to account for the degradations above and beyond those in the periphery. One question we want to address is whether the high frequency pure tone average or the speech intelligibility index is a better predictor of the quicksand score. We address this question by asking the model, asking which model needs less variance in the cognitive degradations to explain the data. In this case, the SII results are much more compact, suggesting that the SII is a better predictor of the peripheral issues. 
With that, I want to acknowledge a number of friends at Google and around the world, colleagues in Sydney, Australia, and here in California, Adobe and Bat and Cat. They have all helped us to better understand these models. Thank you.